Good morning, welcome to Pearls of Eden. Happy Wednesday, Wisdom. I'm Marilyn Acosta, and I'm so glad that you joined me this morning. I have a word that will surely bless you all. Um, early in the morning, the Lord gave me this word, Ezra 8, and it is powerful. It talks about the redemption of his people. There are so many mysteries in the word of God, and it is so good to sit at his feet and just allow him to teach you and show you what it is that he wants to reveal to you. You know, there is a proverb, Proverbs 25, which says, it is the glory for a king to conceal a matter, but it is also a glory for kings to search it out. And we live in a time where everybody wants things just given to them. But we serve a God of such great mystery, a God of such great revelation. And he rewards those who seek him diligently. So as I was in the word of God today, he just continued to pull out some treasures that I have never, ever even seen. You know, God will hearken your spirit to go and research something, just a word. He'll hearken your spirit to go and see what this is about. And he'll just blow your mind about the revelation that he'll speak to you through his spirit. This is why it's so important that we sit in the presence of God and we have intimate fellowship with him. That when we sit in his presence, we are like children. You know, I, I've said this before that anytime I see a vision with God, I am always a child, you all walking with my father, hand in hand, allowing him to teach me, allowing him to love on me, allowing him to adore me. Sometimes when we get in the presence of God, we get all religious, some of us. And I've been there where we think that we have to, you know, come so fervently and so boldly and so strongly. And so, you know, and there's a place for that. And so formally, and there's a place for that. But we also have to understand how to come with him and just be a child to inquire at his throne, to inquire, Father, what does that mean? Father, I read this in your word and I saw that I don't quite line up to that, but I want to. By your grace, will you help me to be this? Because I see it's something you delight in. And I want you to delight in me. I want to be the apple of your eye. I read that in scripture that I am the apple of your eye. And you just talk to the Father real, y'all. We got to get rid of these pretenses and we have to be real with the Father. This is how we build a relationship with him. Yes, there's a place of honor. Yes, there is a place of fear. There's a place of reverence. But there is a place in his presence where we abide in him as a child. And we are free just to be with our Father and to be ourselves. So today I want to talk to you about returning that's the word, the message of the season. Repent, return to your first love. Why would you continue to walk in the wrong way and perish? Why? When you have the great deliverer, the great I am that is extending his scepter so that you might find favor in his sight and not perish. Isn't that what he did for Queen Esther? Queen Esther, she fasted, she prayed, she did all that she could. She put on her royal garments and she interceded for her people. She went before the king and she had this in her mind and her heart. If I perish, I perish, but I shall go before the king and give him this petition. When you've done all that you can do, it's time to step before the king. It's time to surrender all of your requests before him. And I'm telling you, we serve such a gracious God. He will extend that scepter to you. You will find favor with God when you spend time with him. You know, there's so many people that have their desires. They have their own wish list, but they don't want to just sit in the presence of God. They just want something from him. But when you seek to walk with God, meaning to know his ways. Oh my gosh, you will win favor from the king. You know, he, we are like our father. We are created in his image, right? He says, let us create them in our image. The image of the Holy Spirit, the word Jesus, and the father. We're created in his image. Those of us who walk by his spirit. So we have our father's ways. And when you meet a friend and you go grow closer to certain friends, it's because they delight in getting to know you. They're not just trying to get something from you, but they want to know what interests you. 
They want to know about your life. They want to know how they can pray for you, how they can be a part of your life. It's not that they just say, hey, I want to be your best friend. They show you that they are your best friend. They know how to get into your presence. They know how to love you. And that is the same with the father. So many people just want something. They just want to be with him. They just want to say they know him. But they don't want to do anything to get in his presence, to win his favor. And, you know, when we meet friends or some of us, we meet people, we say, you know, I, I no longer align to them. They're just users. They just want to be around you when they need something. They just, you know, they don't have my interest at heart. They don't care about the things that I care of. They never ask about, you know, how's this going on? I know this is your heart. They ignore the things that you dream, your visions. But when we call ourselves a people of God, we sit before God and we say, what's on your agenda, Father? What's your vision? How can I help you accomplish your goals? You know, it's beautiful to meet people like that. How many of you know people like that? When you have a vision or a dream, they show up for you. They don't ignore it. They don't pretend like they don't see you, but they say, how's it going? They know how to encourage you. They know how to support you. I know such a soul like that. She knows how to support. She knows how to encourage. Sometimes I wonder if she's even an earthly being. That's how beautiful her soul is, her spirit. You all, this is how we have to be in the sight of our father, pure in heart. All right, but I said all that, but let's get into today's word because it's so good, y'all. Ezra 8. Now, there are a few words that I want to talk to you about that came across as I studied this um, passage. Ahava. He says, let us go before Ezra. They're returning to the king. They're returning to serve the father with all their heart and their mind and their spirit. You see, they had been taken captive. They had been serving idols. But Ezra was a man of God that not only desired to learn the word of God, but he desired to teach the word of God and to bring others back to the king. You know, what good is it for us just to find salvation for ourselves, but then we don't lead others? You know, God has placed this in my heart and my spirit from the very beginning. Everything that he shares with me is not for me to keep. I have to leave this place empty. I've got to share everything that I know because I am here to win souls to the kingdom of God. I'm not here just on my own commission, but we have a purpose. And it's so important that you know your purpose. Do you know that we all are here to fulfill the great commission? To share the gospel? To lead souls out of darkness into the marvelous light? And that's what Ezra did. Ezra, they were going by the river of Ahava. And I just thought, that's such a beautiful name, Father. What does that mean? And in my search and discovery, I found out the most beautiful revelation that Ahava means love. It means great love. Almost like, what's the other word that we, agape. It's such a deep love. You see, the Father has an eternal love for us. He has not a passive love, but an aggressive love. He goes after us. He's zealous for us. The Bible says he's jealous for us. And Ahava means love. God will redeem and carry his people. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to say that again. God will redeem and carry his people. And so we're going to see that. We're going to see that love set in motion in Ezra chapter 8. And we're also going to, also going to see a people that trust in God. Remember I said in this season, although there's shaking that is happening around us and that is still to come, we are those who don't trust in chariots. We don't trust in what the world systems tell us we should do, but we first seek the kingdom of God and we put all of our trust in him and we allow him to order our steps. And that can seem foolish to people that rely on the world. But when we rely on God, he never puts us to shame. So let's learn and listen from Ezra chapter 8, okay? Ezra chapter 8. So I'm not going to read the beginning of this section because it goes through the genealogy of all those who went 
with Ezra to go forth and to give free will offerings and to return to the most high God. And I love this. I, the Lord put this song in my heart. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, how I want to be in that number. Oh, when the saints go marching in. And I thought all of these saints, they're returning, they're going in, they're marching towards their king to give free offerings, and they're named. God doesn't forget them. You know, the Bible tells us there's a book of remembrance, a book of life with all of our names. We want to be found. We want to be counted among the righteous. And I just love that because it goes through all of their names of the righteous men and women that would go up, the men um, to give free will offerings. And it talks about the service of the temple. Do you all know that we are the temple of the living God? We are the one that houses, we are the houses, the tabernacles of the most high God. Hallelujah. He dwells in these earthly vessels. We carry such treasure. And this is why you have to be careful who you dismiss. You think you're just dismissing people, just mere mortals, when you might just be dismissing God. It's something to think about, right? Now I gathered them by the, the river that flows to Ahava. And we just talked about what Ahava means. God will redeem and gather his people. It means love. And we camped there three days. And I looked among the people and the priests and found none of the sons of Levi there. Levi represents the priest of God. You had to have a specific role to service the king, the temple, the tabernacle. And the Levites were the ones to do that. And so he's looking for the sons of Levi. He said, then I sent for Elzar, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elanathan, Jerib, Elanathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshulam, leaders. Also for Jerob and Elanathan, men of understanding. Not anyone could just service the altar of God. Didn't we learn that from Uzziah who came so close and touched the ark and he fell dead? No, there had to be things done in proper protocol, proper spiritual protocol. They wanted to do things in excellency, the way God had ordained. So he looks for men of understanding. And I gave them a command for Edo the chief man at the place of Kasifia. And I told them what they should say to Aido and his brethren and the Nithenium at the place of Kasifia that they should bring us servants for the house of God. And I said, Nithenium, God highlighted that word to me. I never really paid attention to it. And so of course I go and I research it and it means set apart. These were servants that were set apart. These were men and women of God that were set apart to service the temple of the Lord. You see, we are called to be set apart. We are those who were chosen. Some people look at that as a bad word. Like you're chosen, who do you think you are? Yeah, I'm a royal priesthood. I am chosen. I am set apart. I am who God says I am. I don't have time to, you know, explain that to you or have to defend myself, I should say. I know who I am. And child of God, you have to know who you are as well, that you are a part of this royal priesthood. You are set apart, you're chosen. And not anyone could just service the temple, but the Nithinium were definitely called chosen people who were set apart to do so. So when I saw that, I thought, God is so faithful, right? What He's just so faithful in broadening our understanding. And so, then by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mahali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, namely Sherebiah, with his sons and brothers, 18 men, and Hashbiath, and with him Jeshia, of the sons of Marara, his brothers and their sons, 20 men, also of the Nethanim, whom David and the leaders had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethium, all of them were designed, I'm sorry, designated by name. And so the next section of text we're gonna talk about is fasting and prayer because they didn't just seek God's face 
without submitting and humbling themselves. The Bible says, if my people shall humble themselves and fast and pray and turn, then I will hear from heaven. You know, a lot of times people want to fast and they even pray, but they don't want to shift. Repentance calls for shift. It calls for you to turn from your wicked ways. I know you don't think that they're, that they're wicked, but God, if God says they're wicked, they're wicked. And you have to be able and willing to shift. So it's not just okay to fast and pray, but there's no turnaround in your life. You have to make the decision, child of God, that you're gonna change the things that God shows you that you know dishonor his word and return to him. Hallelujah. So the next section, let's talk about it because it talks about fasting and prayer for protection. Do you know when you fast and pray according to Isaiah 58 and you do those things, it's all laid out for you, child of God, in Isaiah 58. You follow those protocol protocols. There is a supernatural divine protection that follows you. Not only that, you gain favor. God honors your fast and prayer when it's done from a right spirit. He honors your petitions, your requests. When it's done in a right spirit, according to Isaiah 58. Let's take a listen. Verse 21 of Ezra 8. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. Listen to Ezra. He's saying, if you will follow after God and seek him with all of your heart and mind and spirit, his hand shall be upon you and you'll prosper. But if you forsake him, oh, his wrath shall be upon you, right? So he was ashamed to ask the king for protection because he was speaking so highly of God. How could he make God seem as though he was inferior that he couldn't even protect his people? You know, the king had already given him so much. He allowed him to go. He financed everything that they needed, gave, sent them away with gold and silver. He didn't want to ask anymore the king, especially after saying how great the God is, the great I am that he served. So he said, you know what? We got to fast, people. We're going to fast and pray right here by the river of Ahava of the a love that represents the love of God, that God will carry and redeem his people. Remember, we just talked about what the definition of Ahava means. And so I think that's so significant that that is where they pray and fast. And it says this. So we fasted and entreated our God for this. And he answered our prayer. Glory to God. And I separated 12 of the elders, I'm sorry, of the leaders of the priests, Sherebiah, Hashaba, and 10 of their brethren and them, and weighed out to them silver and gold and articles of offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his princes and all Israel who was present had offered and they're weighing all of the silver and gold. All of this is going as a free will offering. You know, the, there's a scripture that says when the people offer themselves willingly, you know, without someone having to beat you over the head to do something. No, you want to bring a sacrifice and an offering to God. You know, that's also part of Isaiah 58. When you feed the needless, when you bring a needy, when you bring an offering, Giving is the perfect time when you're fasting and when you're praying to reach out to the needy, to give to God, to offer him a sacrifice. That is the best time, you all. You should always give when you are fasting. Hallelujah. So you just seek for opportunities and you ask the Father to reveal opportunities for you to give to those that he would be pleased in you doing ministries, needy people, homeless people. Give your alms, right? And so they're coming 
with their free offering. It says, you are holy to the Lord. These articles are holy also. And the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord God of your fathers. Watch and keep them until you weigh them. So, you know, they're just going by and they're just offering all of these things to the most high God. They're giving a sin offering. They're not returning empty handed. So many people just want to return empty handed. Okay, Lord, here I am. <laughs> No, you know, they did not give the offering of Cain. Cain just gave what was there, his little fruits and vegetables. He just went into the garden and gave what he had. But Abel, his sacrifice was righteous. He gave out of his firstling, the first that he had. You know, one time the Lord explained it to me like this. When you give your first, you give your best. Like when I was at a restaurant and my son, I was like, oh, he had Oreo, these hot Oreo, fresh cookies that came right out of the kitchen, you know, out of the the uh, back. And I was like, oh, I want one. And he was like, uh-uh, I don't, these are mine, right? And then when they were done and he had ate to satisfaction, there was one left and he was like, here you go. And I'm like, I don't want that. I wanted the one that was fresh out of the kitchen. And that's what God said, that's how it is for my people, right? Don't just give me something after you fool, you paid your bills, you paid everything because you had more faith in paying the electric company, you had more faith in paying your rent and mortgage, you had more faith in giving their money first than you did to me, who is the provider of your job, who is the provider of your income, who gave you a place to stay. And I was like, dear Jesus, this is what we do. So we don't want to be like that. We don't want to offer a Cain sacrifice and be upset when God is not pleased with it when we give him our leftovers. Oh, I got enough. I can give my tithes and offerings. No, it comes first. Woo, y'all. All right. Are we learning or are we learning, right? That's what the word of God is. It's correction. It's good for our spirits. It's good for our soul. The word is good. It corrects us. The Bible says, give me a righteous man to correct me. It will be like oil on my head. I will not turn it away. But a wicked person, they cannot stand correction. They cannot stand any critique. They cannot stand anybody telling them anything that might not be right about them, even though they know. They don't want to hear it. But a righteous man will be like, you know what? I never saw it like that. And you got a point. Thank you. I can make the correction now. I can shift. And that's what it's all about. These people shift. So we learned two new words, Ahava and Nemanite. Who knew, right? Right there in the scriptures, but it's beautiful. And so uh, one last thing that I wanted to talk to us about well, let me, I have a few more notes. I don't want to read this because if I wrote it down, it's pretty important, I guess. This was an urgent call back to God, repentance, Ezra 8. The prophet Zephaniah answered the day coming, the day of the Lord. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one. He will save. He will not, I'm sorry, he will remain silent in his Ahava love. He will exalt over you. Zephaniah 3 17 and when we think about God is going to remain silent over me what does that mean I thought about that and he's silent against your sins when you accept Jesus Christ as your savior and you walk with him he he removes your sins as far as it is from the east to the west okay he doesn't keep bringing them back up to you they're out of his mind they're out of his heart they're out of his sight so you need to stop bringing them back up to him. If you are walking in a way that's pleasing and you've turned, there's no need to keep bringing up old past sins. That's what Satan does. The accuser of the brethren is the one that wants you to remember everything you've ever done. When you give it to God and you repent and you've shifted, he doesn't remember it anymore. And this is why it's so dangerous when you bring up another person's sin and you don't know, oh my gosh, have they repented? Does God even have any remembrance of it? But you're bringing it up. You're bringing it. You're being the accuser of the brethren. That's a problem. That's dangerous, in fact. And on this Wednesday Wisdom, I want to caution you because, you know, a lot of people, especially with ministers, women and men of God, prophets and prophets and just pastors, teachers, whoever, the brethren, people can see your flesh. They can see your weakness. 
and they'll go into attack mode. Nobody's perfect, you all. No man or woman of God is going to be perfect. We all fall short of the glory of God. We are all striving day to day, but you don't know the contents of a man's heart. You can sit up there and judge people like people probably judge King David. They thought, oh my gosh, he sent another man's husband to the front lines so he could have Bathsheba. He had a baby and affair with him, his, his, one of his most loyal men's wife. He betrayed, but he repented. He turned. He was so sorrowful for what he did. And God forgave him. Were there consequences? Absolutely. Very, very severe consequences for what David did. But nonetheless, the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Because when he fell short, he would repent. He would turn. Why am I saying that some of you see men and women of God's, their, their flesh, their weaknesses, and you attack? Not knowing that God is forgiving them. Touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. It is dangerous when you touch a chosen one. You bring sickness. You bring poverty. You bring death. You bring all these things in your life unnecessarily because you couldn't control the thoughts of your heart. You couldn't control your mouth. And you begin to speak against a man or woman of God. We all have flesh. None of us are perfect. And I've, this is why I know prophets and pro, prophetesses and men and women of God, some people are, especially prophets, are just very close off because the moment they reveal a little bit of their humanity and who they are, people jump all over it. Oh, they get familiar with you. Be careful to protect your familiarity when you're dealing with a prophet because as soon as you see a little bit of their humanity, you want to be like, well, are they really called by God? Are they really used? You have to say, God, help me to always see them as you see them. Always let me keep the honor that you have for them because I want to get a prophet's reward. Hallelujah. So you have to be careful that with men and women of God, that in your, especially if you have the privilege of being friends and getting to know them and being close to them, that when you begin to see their humanity, that you don't discount it. The Bible says in Psalms 27, and I remember the Lord clearly gave me this revelation, you all. Flesh represent weakness. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? When the wicked came to eat upon my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. And the Lord revealed to me that the flesh, what that represents is your weakness, your humanity. You're not, you're not going to be perfect until you get that new glorified body. You're still going to be battling. As Paul said, I have a thorn on my side, but he kept enduring, running the race. But those who come to eat upon your flesh, your weaknesses, they're going to stumble and they're fall. They're going to fall because I keep telling you and I keep warning, touch not my prophets and do, touch not my anointed, I'm sorry, and do my prophets, no harm. So, that's the word that I want us to focus on today, on this Wednesday, Wednesday, returning, examining ourselves to see how we can walk in a better way, allowing the Holy Spirit to show us, to walk in forgiveness. You cannot be someone that is so easily offended and you hold offenses in your heart and you want to be forgiven by the Most High God. Forgiveness will take you out of the presence of God. You can't walk into this season with it. So release people who don't meet your expectations. Release them from, from your offense, okay? No one in this life owes us anything, you all. Release them when they don't treat you right. You know, the Lord gave me this, this quote while I was resting in my sleep. If people, um, what did he say? If, if people cannot, um, wait a minute, give me a second, guys. If basically, if people can't appreciate or value your presence, then you have to bless them with your absence. There's some people that keep you on red. There's some people that are going to ignore you like we talked about earlier, no matter what. They just don't know how to receive you. They don't have the capacity for you. And you just have to be able to bless them with your absence. Bye-bye. I love you. It was nice knowing you for the season. But I got to move on. We had a great time while it lasted, didn't we? But I got to move on. And you leave and you go in peace. But you've got to learn if they cannot accept you, 
if they can't appreciate the value you bring to the table, then you got to bless them with a goodbye. Bless them with your absence and keep moving. Because we're in a season where what? We are ascending. We're moving higher, baby. All right. So I pray that this word blesses, blesses you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you haven't, please join the community. Subscribe, share, like. I love you all. I love you to life. Have a blessed day. Bye.